And he's a snazzy dresser. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning. Happy Sunday. So um, I, I, I feel that it's appropriate that we're doing this on a Sunday morning because I feel like what we're going to do, at least with the keynote talks, is really take you to church. Because I think that there's going to be a lot of amens and yeses because, you know, the, the, the crowd that we have in this room is very self-selected. You woke up on a Sunday morning because you want to be a person who has a voice in medicine that goes beyond just the science that you do and the clinical work that you do every day. So I want to first thank the organizers and then thank you. And I think you deserve a round of applause for being here. So thank you so much. And as Dr. Dubay said, um, if you see someone who's over 30, you should ask them to tell you a story. So since I'm barely over 30, I thought that <laughs> the right, thanks, the right way to do this is really to tell that was, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Um, the right way to do this is to just tell a story. Um, my job is to talk about the importance of physician advocacy, and I think that though um, it, it feels a little narcissistic to talk about yourself, I'm gonna talk about some of the things that I did right, some of the things that I did wrong, that really uh, allowed me to create what is a career, like our, our uh, mentor that we share together, Dr. Mary Bassett, um, that really allowed me to create a career that is about advocacy entirely. And so I think that that, I think, will be an important uh, uh, message and voyage as I tell my story now that I'm 32. So the, the beginning for me really was, um, I'm going to go way back. Um, my parents were immigrants as well. They, they came from Greece looking for a, a better life. Um, they landed in uh, suburban Washington, D.C., and part of that better life was that they wanted me to get a good education. And so they said, we're going to send you to a private school because that's what, you know, you're supposed to do. And so they sent me to a private school, a small one, and um, I learned at what it really felt like for the first time to be looked at as different. So I landed in this school, and I was uh, clustered together with two other, it was a very small school, all boys school, about 30 people in my class. So there was me, the black guy, and the Jewish guy. And we were the crew. We were set apart and separate, and um, my initial experience was learning what it was like to be bullied and to be teased and to be made felt um, small because of who I am, how I look, what my background is and what my perceived sexuality was. So my response to that was, and there are a couple of ways you can respond, was to become their leader as opposed to be someone who is uh, looked upon as inferior. And so um, my task in high school was to really figure out a way to become a leader there, but I also took my very first opportunity that I had to leave that environment. And when I had the chance to apply for a college, um, I remember um, a, a prominent New York City university uh, landed to have a, a day to have people learn about their, their program, and I was the only one who went. And so um, it was my chance at escape. Um, to leave an environment where I was automatically looked at as other and where um, bullying really molded a lot of my um, early adolescence. Um, so I did come to New York. I, I went to Columbia um, University as an undergraduate, and there um, I came out as a gay man. And I moved to New York in 1991, and my first introduction to being gay was being in New York City nightlife. So watch Party Monster the movie and you'll see what my life was like when I, not kidding, when I, was, um, when I started out here. And really, what I, what I really think about that environment, it really molded my, my sort of move toward activism in a couple of different ways. The first is that sort of moving from, New York, from, uh, from Arlington, Virginia to New York City, I didn't really have a lot of encounters with a diverse group of people. I felt that it was pretty myopic, pretty narrow. And then I remember going out to New York City clubs, meeting people whose gender identities were what they were, kind of sometimes uh, un undifferentiable. They, couldn't, they didn't define themselves. People from every race, every sexuality, in fact, one of my favorite um, stories from college was um, I was working with uh, the dean of the law school um, in New York City, who was this fabulous um, black woman who was very young and became a dean, so automatically a role model in terms of what you see. And one day, she said to me, um, we need to meet on Sunday at 6 a.m. because I'm going to take you to church. I'll try anything. I'm like, sure. I mean, I love you. I'll go to church. So um, we meet. And um, she takes me to a place called Sound Factory. 
And so my church was the house ball scene in New York City on a Sunday morning at 8 a.m. So it's a great example. Like right there, you just see like a diversity. And then what I realized was as I was going out and seeing all these people and making all these friends, some of them would disappear. I wouldn't know where they went. They all of a sudden just stopped arriving, stopped coming out. And what I learned was that a lot of those people were disappearing because they were getting admitted to the hospital. They were getting sick. They had HIV. It was before the days of antiretrovirals that were effective. And you wouldn't see them again because they would die. And it became a really important mission for me to really understand what that really means in the community. And HIV, like a lot of other infectious diseases, really likes to find people who can afford the least to be sick with it. So it identifies populations that have stigma against them, that are already medically disenfranchised, who aren't able to access care prevention, and who sometimes are scared to access care and prevention because of the same bullying that I would have experienced in high school, but this time bullying by an institution that won't look at them as a valid person because of who they love or what their gender identity or race is. So it became really clear to me that um, I was going to sort of to work somewhere in the environment of doing advocacy that touches HIV AIDS and specifically LGBTQ health. So fast forward, still in college, um, I was a biology religion double major, so I was a little busy, um, but I decided to work with a display of the AIDS memorial quilt that l would land in New York City um, in 1995. So I really didn't know what that meant, um, but I, I saw that population, I, those were people that I loved, I worked in the LGBTQ space, I knew I wanted to be a doctor, and at that point, a lot of LGBTQ medicine was revolving around HIV AIDS, so for me, that was the way to get into that environment. And so I remember working on this quilt, and one of the things I had to do um, was go to San Francisco to pick up a piece of the quilt to bring it back for display at the university. And I will never forget the feeling of walking into a, a, a giant warehouse. It was all white, it smelled like teak wood, I can remember it. And it was just lined with panels and panels rolled up in, in, little, in little rolls, shrouded by white linen, um, of people who died of people who didn't make it and people who were remembering them by putting a piece of their soul on a piece of cloth. I was asked to carry a piece of it back. In fact, a piece that had Ryan White's name on it. And um, I remember having to carry it um, in the, in the um, airport. And it felt like carrying a body. And it was like, I have the weight of my population on me. I have the people who I love. I'm carrying this thing back to put this up and create a display at Columbia um, for people to come. And boy, did I not know what to expect when one of my co-organizers died while we were creating the display. And soon thereafter, we actually had the display. The date is burned in my mind because it's the day that I decided what I was gonna do. April 23rd, 1995, we opened the display. The quilt was all over campus. And all of a sudden, we saw people coming who had lost loved ones, some of whom were just babies, children, definitely under 30 and also who themselves were so sick they could barely come. So I remember standing on College Walk in the middle of Columbia, thinking of my, to myself, so I wanna be a doctor and now my job is to never let this happen to anyone, to prevent this infection in people and for people who have the infection, do everything in my power to make sure that their lives are high quality. I will never forget that day. And then I went to med school, which I loved, but was not exactly the place to, at that time, that created an environment to promote advocacy. So medical school was about science. And the effect of that was that you don't really see the bias that often creates institutional barriers to what you're allowed to do. Because sometimes curricula hide behind science. Reality is that I wanted to do things in the LGBTQ space there wasn't a lot of opportunity. One of my favorite examples of being motivated to try to fix that was that um, NYU, and the and, um, this is not in any way against NYU, they've evolved so much, Richard Green in the room doing amazing work, um, but at that time, they didn't want medical students to go on the AIDS ward. And the reason was they didn't want to be known as an AIDS medical school. And so I had to sneak on the ward 
And so I used to hang out with the attendings to see these patients. I had my first transgender patient there. I saw my first patient with, op with the op with opportunistic infections that eventually I grew up to treat when I was a uh, attending physician working at that same hospital. And I learned a lot about care and a lot about the population and really about the advocacy that I wanted to do. But then I said, after I was done with my med school, I need, to, I need to change. I need to go somewhere else. I need to see how other things are done. So I moved to Boston, um, where I decided to uh, be a resident at Beth Israel Deaconess. And I, I was talking to Richard Green while we were um, uh, listening to Dr. Dubai's amazing talk, thank you, um, about the difference that, that in Boston, there actually were hospitals that had people who were Medicaid patients, quote unquote, privately insured people, like all in the same place. Like one of my favorite stories has to do with, um, uh, and I actually think there's an article in JAMA about it, uh, the waiting room at Massachusetts General Hospital's infectious disease clinic. So they saw everyone, regardless of insurance status, whether they were insured or uninsured, and um, they had three kinds of clinics. The state sexually transmitted infection clinic, the HIV clinic, and the travel clinic. So you cannot talk about three more different populations. My joke was always, there was the fine young thing with the drip who had to come get treated for gonorrhea or chlamydia. There was a 55 year old uh, couple who was going to safari, to safari to Africa and needed their yellow fever vaccine. And then there was the HIV AIDS patient who was coming either really sick or with their just chronic medical needs. And the thing that was amazing was they talked to each other. In that waiting room, it's the best conversations that you've ever heard. Because honestly, people like each other. People like to hear other experiences. And it was amazing to see what happens when medicine blends and the barriers aren't defined by public hospital, private hospital. Now with that said, I learned a lot when I was in Boston. Um, I had the opportunity to work with some really amazing leaders in HIV care. And when I was a resident, um, I wanted more experience doing LGBT LGBTQ health, and so what I did was um, I created a little independent track and started seeing patients at the Fenway Clinic in Boston, which is one of the premier LGBTQ clinics in the country. And um, I saw my first AIDS patients that were ambulatory. I learned how to do use antiretroviral therapy. I, again, learned how to do outpatient management, hormones for transgender individuals, just all the stuff that I wouldn't have gotten to do regularly. Ultimately, I did my infectious disease fellowship and uh, did, in, did HIV focus and decided that I was gonna try to be in the lab. So Andre said he was chatty, I am the chattiest person you'll ever meet. So the lab was not exactly right for me. Um, <laughs> watching cell cultures grow, waiting for gels to run. It was really fun and you should do it if you liked it, but it really, I really didn't have that opportunity to, you know, hang out so much. So I was doing this work and, you know, I sort of, I, I, was, I was getting good at it. You know, my technique was good, I'm getting results, I had publications. And then I remember sitting um, in my little cubicle as a fellow, and all of a sudden, a uh, article came up on my computer. Uh, it was Tom Frieden, um, the uh, former director of CDC, used to be the D uh, Department of Health um, commissioner in New York City, and, and he was reporting that there was a case of multi-drug resistant HIV um, with rapid progression in someone who was acutely infected. And so, all of a sudden, a light bulb went off, and I'm like, why am I here in a lab in Boston doing work on cells and viruses when I really want to do work in public health and people? So I ran downstairs and started calling people, and ultimately I found a job that brought me back to uh, New York City. Specifically, it brought me back to Bellevue Hospital, NYU, um, where I worked for a while as a um, attending physician doing HIV research. But the whole time I was doing research, all I kept trying to do was figure out how to make research do public health which was, I think, a good idea, but not exactly perfectly on target for me. So again, I go back to this case of rapid um, progression after an HIV infection. Soon after I landed back at Bellevue, I went to a conference, and what I found out through molecular epidemiology that was done, um, presented at that conference, was that that infection happened at a commercial sex venue in New York City, specifically a bathhouse. And another light bulb went off, which said, why isn't anybody testing for HIV infection at the bathhouses? Well, it's because 
they couldn't get in, they didn't really try, and they didn't have a consistent program. So I made an appointment with the guy who owns the commercial sex venue, or who was the manager. I'll tell you that behind that is also a lot of really in, uh, great stories. Someday I'll write a book about it, but I'll, I won't share it right now. Um, but ultimately I went to him and I said, the reason I'm back here is to prevent that from happening and to go in there and do this work. And so ultimately I used research funding that was screening for a study for acute HIV infection to demonstrate that there was high efficacy in going in these venues and doing testing with about a, a, an HIV rate of 12.5% among the people that were testing. That's really, really high. And so eventually that program got expanded and I published on it, and then I had no more money because it's research to do it, so I knocked on the Department of Health store, and they decided to actually fund it. And so um, where I work now, ironically, is funding that program still. Um, so the idea really was that I listened to my community, I saw what was going on in science, and I identified an area for advocacy. So then, eventually, I had a couple of other programs that blossomed really based on that, and it was really an amazing experience, but then I decided that I was going to leave Bellevue, and I was going to try to be a medical director at a big hospital in an HIV program, and I did that um, right down the block at Mount Sinai, where I was the uh, medical director for two clinics. Um, I was very happy there. Um, I had a nice paycheck. Um, coming in as a medical director. And then Jay Varma, who was my predecessor in my position, who I'd never met before, said, someone told me to send you this email. We're looking for a new assistant commissioner in the Bureau of HIV. Do you want to do it? So I said, yes, I think. So I interviewed and found out that I was looking at a $70,000 pay cut advocacy costs sometimes, but you have to do the right thing. Um, and ultimately what happened was I, uh, I applied for the position and I was interviewed and I was uh, offered the position by Dr. Bassett. Um, and then I got a little worried. I'm like, I'm leaving clinical medicine. I'm not, I'm, this is out of my sort of realm of comfort. And then I got an email, and if you haven't seen the movie How to Survive a Plague, I recommend that you do see it. Uh, Mark Harrington from ACT UP sent me an email, and the subject line was, history is calling. Are you going to answer? You can't really say no to Mark Harrington after you see that movie. So I decided to do that. Now let me tell you what happens when you take your advocacy and decide that you're going to work within the system that sometimes has created institutional racism, sexism, and homophobia. If you have an environment where you're able to do the work, you're able to change an entire city, potentially an entire country if you do the right thing. So the experience that I had doing work with HIV AIDS and LGBTQ populations um, really blossomed when New York City and New York State said, we're going to work on ending the epidemic of AIDS and we're gonna do it in a way that no other city has done and that's by creating a $26 million investment. Now, Dr. Daskalakis, how do you wanna spend it? Well, I wouldn't be able to answer that question if I hadn't been connected to community and advocates and I, I hadn't reached out to those advocates to get a better idea. And so the effect of that is that our STD clinics are no longer about disease, they're about sexual health. We've made them better at LGBTQ health, we've made them better at, at, at um, working with folks from other neighborhoods and from, uh, from um, environments that sometimes aren't comfortable going into these clinics. We were able to launch programs that reached out to the community in a way that, that has never happened before, really resulting in some of um, the most historic decreases in HIV AIDS that we've seen in any city and definitely in New York City. And then um, it went beyond that and I went full circle again looking at how HIV AIDS needs to be separated from the reality of LGBTQ health. And I remember my own story of having a physician um, who I went to see who refused to actually talk about my sexuality and was making medical errors by not offering me the right testing and screening. And so um, when New York City said, well, what are you going to do about it? The result was that we created a campaign called Bear It All that told people, if you can't talk to your doctor about your sexuality, your drug use, and everything else, fire them, because we vetted 130 um, who are fabulous, and we'll refer you there instead. Now, that really comes from a personal experience, an experience that a lot of other people have, but my own personal experience poured into advocacy and then using um, an infrastructure to move things. So ultimately, I think some of my messages to you are, listen to who you are. Who you are is really important. When you go to med school, when you go through residency, there are moments where people try to erase your identity. 
They try to make you this sort of more homogenized person where you are able to interact with patients and don't really bring your soul and your spirit into what you're doing. Bring your soul and spirit into what you're doing. It makes a big difference. Patients know, and when you advocate for one patient, realize that that is the same muscle that you can flex to advocate for a population. It's not different. Medicine is a hierarchy. Very often you have to work in it, but you need to be able to work within the hierarchy so you preserve your status while also making it clear that you're not going to be bullied to do the wrong thing because that's what we've done forever. You need to focus on mechanisms and strategies to change the dialogue rather just than to just live within the dialogue. Opportunities present themselves constantly. They always mean more work. They usually mean less money. They usually put you in environments where you feel a little bit uncomfortable, but no muscle has ever become stronger without discomfort. You need to exercise your voice and you need to play a little bit with boundaries. I'll tell you that it's, it's, it's a great conversation I had with Mary Bassett, who's now come up three times. I, I wish you were here too today. Um, but I remember having a conversation with her and she said, Dimitri, you know, you do a lot of the stuff in the LGBTQ space. Do you ever worry that people are just like, this is your thing and that's why you're doing it. It's not really an important thing, it's just your thing. And I go, are you asking because people say the same thing about you and race? And she goes, I am. I go, I think that we have the same answer, that it's the right thing to do and that you're actually channeling your identity into the work that you're doing. And unlike a lot of what you learn in sort of becoming a, a physician, it's not about erasing what you think, it's about checking what you think to make sure that you're being respectful. I think Richard will remember when, um, I think you were my med student or resident or all of it, um, one of the things that I used to teach my students was when you walk in a room and you're gonna, going to start talking to a patient about their lives and they tell you something that is different than what you expect, shocking, or potentially in your mind distasteful, the very first thing that you need to think is check your face. The second that you look like you're judging, it changes the entire story and that relationship is affected. If you think that that's true for one patient, it's true for populations as well. Check your face, think about what you mean, think about what you say, those words are important, your actions are important, your desire to, to, to advocate for a population comes from your soul, it comes from your heart, and it comes from who you are and the experiences you either have had yourself or that you empathize with through the patients that you interact with. Thank you very much.